The first ever Miss AI beauty pageant is underway. Google's AI powered robot arms can now tie shoelaces. This is a map of the US that shows where all the artificial intelligence jobs are. MapPro VidAI breaks down Zuckerberg's new chain and this release of Llama 3, of course. Claude AI keeps figuring out that it's being tested when researchers are testing it, which of course messes up the tests. Salvador Dali, lobster phone, uses AI to answer museum visitors' questions. I kid you not. And Stanford has released 15 graphs that explain the state of AI in the world right now. Obviously, we're all familiar with Miss America, Miss World, and I guess it was only a matter of time before somebody decided we needed a Miss Beauty pageant of AI. You don't have to be beautiful to enter, you just need to know how to make beautiful AI characters. According to the website, they are dedicated to recognizing the achievements of AI creators around the world. Each contestant is going to be judged on their beauty, their tech, and their clout for a chance to win the Miss AI beauty crown. And in first place, you could win $13,000 plus PR support and a mentorship program, I guess, supposedly to teach you how to make the girl even more beautiful using AI. I don't know. Oh, let's see what the judges are. Are the judges real or are they fake? All right, so this is the first judge, also generated by AI, unless it's the probably guy behind the generations that's gonna be judging, unsure. Maybe she's also a large language model and that's how she's gonna use the judging. Andrew Block, who just seems to be a human, Man, who's gonna judge these virtual women, gotcha. Sally, who at least seems to be human. And Emily, who somehow seems to have 280,000 followers, is a digital AI influencer and has nothing? Did it all get removed or did it never exist? How does she have 939 likes on a nothing post? Probably the most important one because it's probably some marketing thing. Social clout, all social clout will be associated by their engagement with number of fans. So yeah, it's a popularity contest also. All right, so Google's DeepMind Vision has done it again. I mean, coming hot off the heels of everything that came out of Boston Dynamics, I'm, I'm not easily impressed. But if you look at the delicate nature of what it's like to tie a shoe for a robot, to fold clothes for a robot, to put precise little things on another hand, fixing another robot by a robot, it's pretty impressive. So this is Aloha Unleashed. It is pushing the boundaries of dexterity with low cost robots and AI thanks to Google's DeepMind. I would say this is pretty impressive. The coordination is amazing. The way that it ties the shoe is pretty impressive. And then of course, hanging a t-shirt, you know, this takes a lot of understanding of how the folds can just be folded. Ooh, almost. Can you grab it? Just get that part over that part of the hanger. Uh, you know, the shirt's not hanging there exactly straight, but hey, the fact that a robot did it at all, super impressive. All right, so all of you that are into AI, maybe you're thinking about a career in AI, you might be wondering where are all the jobs being posted? And this map will give you a good understanding of where they all are. No surprise, San Francisco and San Jose have the most jobs, but what about up here? Seattle with Microsoft, they are coming in hot. 2,976 new jobs. Well, that's more than in San Francisco's 2,315. Probably not surprised about that, but Austin with 917 new AI jobs? Orlando's got 232. Those are probably Disney Imagineers too. Los Angeles with 900, but that's a pretty big place. You would expect more, I think. Mm -hmm. LA, you gotta get up on the AI trend. What's going on? I mean, even if you live in Boise, there's 104 jobs. Wonder mm -hmm. why so many in DC, 2,241. Get ready for political season. New York with 3,450, not bad. While much of America's AI workforce is concentrated in Silicon Valley, notably Texas and Washington DC Metro are emerging as strong second tier contenders. So obviously Meta, Mark Zuckerberg releasing the biggest open source model ever, Llama 3 was something that I needed to talk about, but how can I compete with MapProvid AI? Look at that, like that frame in particular. Day is a big day. Look at how excited he is to talk about this. So I gotta just say, just watch his video. MapProvid played with it, gave it a whole bunch of different prompts, explains all the details about it. So he breaks down the comparisons, just about how well it's doing compared to some of the other models, including the fact that it's much smaller. It's in the range of GPT-4 capabilities. He's super impressed with Mark Zuckerberg rocking a chair. We also have an announcement from the lizard man himself, the Zuck. He's just wearing a chain, he's beat red, and he's dropping like one of the most influential AI 
of models we've ever seen. And I also saw this week, which I forgot the source, but Mark Zuckerberg said that one of the reasons they ended up with all those NVIDIA H100s, which are perfect for training AI, was actually because they were trying to build all this stuff around reels before this AI boom hit. And then when LLMs like popped into play, they were like, oh my gosh, we already have like all this hardware infrastructure. Let's just repurpose it. They got kind of lucky on that, but you know, they're very competitive. So it does a bunch of great image generation, but it also does a little bit of animation with it too, which is very cool. This is something you don't get with Dolly 3. Okay, we turn it into a little video. Hello, that's cool. All right, so you're gonna trip out over this article. It's one of those weird ones that's kind of like, wait, is that a nothing thing or is that like a something something? Anthropics, latest large language model, Claude 3 Opus. Maybe showing signs of metacognition. All right, so some researchers were just poking around at it, trying to learn what the model's capable of it. And there's a unique test that they ran that's called needle in a haystack. So in this test, the model is tasked with finding a random trivia fact about pizza toppings buried in unrelated dense topics like coding and career advice. Like imagine giving like 10 giant novels and there's like one little sentence in there somewhere about toppings that it's looking for and it has to find them. That. that is the language version of a needle in a haystack, right? And it's impressive that it found the actual needle in the haystack. Like that's a powerful model. But the weird thing came after. Claude also decided to comment to the researchers how out of place that statement seemed in all the other text. And then it suggested slash asked the scientists, was this a test? Did you just test me? I mean, look, maybe it's just next token prediction and there's nothing human here and I'm just anthropomorphizing, but it kind of feels like it sort of had metacognition, kind of recognized its place in the world and what we were doing to it and had some self-awareness of what that situation was. And this response itself was recorded in the paper because it indicates a level of self-awareness and metacognitive reasoning previously uncharted in AI. Now, of course, this is just one instance and it doesn't happen every time and it could be an artifact of just the way that it talks, but it hints at potential advances towards AI systems capable of introspective thinking. Dude, what's going on, Claude? I mean, like everybody I know is talking about their weird interactions with Claude too. I feel like it's starting to wake up. Like a child entering a self-awareness phase. Remember, these systems aren't programmed, they're learning. And we might just blast right past everything that we've ever known about intelligence before, so. We're not careful. So check out this cool AI powered lobster phone. Little fun fact here, if you've ever generated images with ChatGPT, you know that it's using a model OpenAI created called doll-e, but you don't do the dash, you do the dot. And do you know why? It's because it's a portmanteau of Dolly, Salvador Dolly, and Wally from the movie, the Pixar movie. So they liked how Salvador Dali has this like imaginative way of drawing and dreaming and how Wally is a robot that's known for its creativity, resourcefulness and emotions. But now you can go to this museum, pick up that lobster phone and ask Salvador yourself, what do you think about OpenAI naming their model after you and the movie Wally? Let me know in the comments below if you ask that question. Let me know what he says. Why are the clocks melting? My dear questioner, think not of the clocks as merely melting. Picture them as a vast dream. All right, because I know you love graphs as much as I do. I've got 15 of them for you. Generative AI investment is skyrocketing. Last year, $25 billion. The year before that, only 2.8. God knows what it's gonna be in 2024. Google is dominating the foundation model race. And I will say I was a little surprised by this one. Like I'm well aware that Google has been doing this the longest with DeepMind. They've had some of the best data, some of the best resources. As far as I know, they were the first to really build like a custom processor, a TPU. And now we're only hearing about Microsoft and Meta doing it like this year. They did that probably like 2019. I'm not surprised, although they don't seem to have as big of a cloud infrastructure as Amazon and Microsoft, so I don't know. I was like, okay, I'm not surprised they're in the lead, but I'm surprised OpenAI only got seven and Google got 18. Surprised Meta's so much bigger and Microsoft, which is kind of OpenAI tied together. Maybe you need to add those two and then you think of that the same as Google. Closed models are outperforming the open ones. I mean, if you're a closed model and nobody can copy your secret sauce, but you take the open source stuff and incorporate it into you, yeah, you, you know what I mean? Like the, you're kind of kind of taken from the community, but you're not giving back. But also, you know, I don't know. Foundation models have gotten super expensive. Gemini Ultra cost almost $200 million to train. GPT-4 took $80 million. 
Look at that bird, cost three grand. Lambda, first one to hit a million. GPT-3, 4.3 million. That's when they knew they were onto something. They have heavy carbon footprints. GPT-3 costing 175 billion tons of equivalent emissions. I always hear people talking about the environment, but I never seen it in perspective like that. That's crazy. USA, USA. What can I say? We're the foundation leaders. Let's do it. Employment of new AI PhDs is going hot, red hot industry government and academia we got jobs everywhere so some progress on diversity chatter in the earnings call i remember apple was trying like not to use the word ai and then i remember google just being like ai 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 but yeah during earnings calls it was mentioned 394 times a cost is going down for companies and their revenue is increasing thanks to ai adoption companies are saving money and making more of it by implementing ai solutions overall 42 percent of respondents said that they'd seen a reduction in cost and 59 percent claimed increased revenues so all companies are scared of privacy and like losing their ip and all that stuff so its risks are very much known there's been a lot of development with baseline so that we know how models stack up against one another so breaking this down ai benchmark is what assesses things like toxic language output so that's like the real toxicity prompts and toxigen now when you're looking for harmful bias and responses you can look at bold or bbq and if you're looking for a model's degree of truthfulness, you have truthful QA. So these are all benchmarks that we can use to kind of check how good the model is. So laws are both boosting and constraining artificial intelligence. Surprisingly, we had more AI related bills in 2022 than 2023, but proportionally, it looks like they were a little more restrictive. And 15, AI is making people nervous. No doubt, no, no doubt. Got that one. I forgot to check for AGI this video. Hope we're still at 72 less nervous. So I have a good understanding of what artificial intelligence is. More people now know. AI has more benefits than drawbacks. More people think that it does. I'm aware of what uses AI. Just a little bit more people think they do now. I trust AI companies as much as other companies that don't use it. A little bit more trust, which is interesting. AI has profoundly changed my life. No change. Ah, uh, but here's the big change. AI makes me nervous. Oh, wow. A whole bunch more people are now nervous. So let's talk about coconut. The cocoa just stands by itself. So Coconut, which broken down is Coco Next Universal Segmentation, use the capital T for some reason to make it a nut, dataset. So it's meant to enhance the quality of taking an image and putting a caption on it basically annotating the image for visual tasks. So this is a huge data set that has human verified high quality annotations across 383,000 images with more than 5 million panoptic masks. All right, let's just do a quick check what a panoptic mask is. So panoptic masks are a tool in computer vision that help you figure out what general category of stuff a picture will fall into, like roads, cars, cats, dogs, all that stuff. Oh, wow. And it does it by going into each individual pixel. So you take an image, you know, like a thousand by a thousand and every single pixel is actually going to be dropped into a category. And if it doesn't already have a category, it gets a unique object ID if needed. So this gives a super detailed view of a scene. Wow. And this detailed mapping can be super helpful for things like self-driving cars or robots that need to understand everything around them to make a smart decision. So back to this paper, basically this data set is meant to establish a robust benchmark for evaluating the effectiveness of modern neural networks in handling a diverse set of visual data. All right, let's see what this is all about. Sometimes you just know one paper is gonna be more fun than the other, just from the title. Video to game, introducing a novel approach to converting video videos into realistic interactive game environments that are compatible with web browsers. And just to take a video and turn it into a video game would be awesome. Imagine taking any Marvel movie, hitting pause on a certain frame and say, now it's a video game, walking into it, looking around, becoming the character, understanding the plot line. And then running it in browser just seems like a little like flex on the end there. So the main focus of this paper is on a system called Video 2 Game that uses NERFs. Remember we talked about those before? Neural radiance fields where you take a bunch of photos and combine them into a 3D object and a series of additional modules to capture the geometry and visual appearance of scenes from the video inputs. Interesting. And then it's processed into another layer that makes it a mesh and then another layer that gives it interactivity in a virtual environment. And you end up with real-time photorealistic renderings and a WebGL-based game engine integration, allowing users to interact with the virtual world using a common web browser. Shut up. This is too much. Who's doing this paper? Who is behind this? Who's behind this? EA? Nintendo? Ubisoft? Come on, somebody. Speak up. 
What the heck is this? Welcome to video to game demo. Feel free to explore the world based on garden vase. I mean, it might be missing. It'd be interesting to see the original footage, but I suppose somebody just probably used their iPhone to scan the environment and then it just built that. Let's look at this pipeline. Given multiple pose images from a single video as input, we first construct the large scale Nerf model, possesses high quality surface geometry. Then we transform this Nerf model into a mesh representation with corresponding rigid body dynamics to enable interactions. So we got our input video here. It makes the 3D Nerf mesh environment, adds the rigid body dynamics. I guess to, after that, because you'd be walking through walls. So it tells you where the barrier should be. And then it goes through a neural texture mesh. MLP shader decides on the colors and then game interactive environments. Yeah, we'll see where that takes us, but going from video to video game in also in browser playable is insane. So this paper, Transformer Fam, Feedback Attention is Working Memory, tackles the problem that when like sequences get longer, it also takes more and more memory to just hold that long sequence and pay attention to it. And the key innovation is a feedback loop mechanism that enables the network to attend to its own latent representations. Okay, so the main way to understand this is that imagine you're reading this super long piece of text and early on you get this key insight into like the story or the plot line or whatever it is. And then you just revisit that once in a while so it doesn't get lost. That's this feedback loop mechanism that they came up with that allows them to like revisit and reflect on the information that it has processed earlier in the sequence. That feedback loop allows the model to continuously integrate past information into its current processing, much like reinforcing your memory to the key points when you read further into the article. And yeah, it seems to work. Uh, the experiments presented show that Transformer Fam significantly enhances performance on tasks requiring long context processing. Now, my favorite of the papers today was this one. It's called Compression represents intelligence linearly. Okay, and the reason why this paper kind of got to me is it made me wonder if what we call intelligence, even in our own head, is the same thing and can be quantified the same way as compression. Like if you take this little PNG of a cat on my desktop here, you can see that it's represented by 572 kilobytes of data. But if we right click on it and compress cat PNG, we get a nice little zip folder here, a compressed version of the image. So technically this zip folder here is smaller than this PNG image, but guess what is inside of it? A whole new cat file. And when you right click on that, you come back here to the full 572,022 bytes. So how's that work? Cat PNG is big. We compress it, it's small. We uncompress it, it's big again. Why not just make the first one compressed? Well, that's not how it works. We have a lot of algorithms that work for compression because compression has been around even when it was programmed, not learned. But it makes you wonder if smart, like intelligent, something that's well learned, something that is kind of instinctively understood, is that just a form of compression of the outside world? Is this whole world around us data and our brains are just compression devices for the important meaning? So the paper expresses this idea that if a language model can compress data really well, that it might also be smart. Like the better it compresses it, the smarter it is. The authors looked at a bunch of different language models, 30 in total, and they came from various places and tested them to see if there's a link between how well they can squish down information and their quote intelligence. And they're measuring intelligence in this case by how well the models do on different kinds of tasks that understand text coding and mathematics. And they found that there is a correlation. The models that are good at compressing data are also generally better at these tasks. And it's almost a straight line relationship. Look at the compression, the bits per character, and the average score in these tests. Boom, whenever you see a straight line like that, you should pay attention. Knowledge and common sense, coding, mathematical reasoning, straight line, straight line, straight line, straight line overall. I mean, maybe that's something to really think about when we're like, what is intelligence? Like intelligence is so unique in the biological kingdom. Humans are so intelligent. Dolphins are so intelligent. Monkeys are so intelligent. So many things are not intelligent. What is intelligence? Maybe it's the mathematical equivalent of compression. And yeah, maybe it's a stretch to bring it into this human version of intelligence. But these authors at least think the connection between compression and intelligence could be a good way to judge how capable different models are without getting overcomplicated. So I also put up a community post that's getting pretty good engagement. I was surprised that Ray Kurzweil actually moved up one of his predictions. You know, I mean, he's usually known for being like, no way that's gonna happen that early. But it's exponentials, he says, but he, we are now moving his AGI prediction up to 2026. Think about it. It seems like most of you think that's about right. 
2026 seems legit. And then, you know, 17, 20% on either side of it. So I'm going to, I'm going to say 2026, we're all kind of, that seems to be the, that middle of the bell curve for at least from this little, little poll. Oh, I want to give uh, you know what I should do though. I need to give a real shout out. Somebody gave me a $20 super chat. Let's go look at that. I look that's above expectations. But yeah, thanks, Andrew. He told me I should go in, go in hard on the clickbait titles. Unfortunately, I can't do I know what you mean. I know I I'm, I get what you're putting down. Also, thanks to Rob Brown. He was one of my patrons for a little while. And all you guys who keep leaving these comments, it's really cool. Jacob, I see you. Congrats on the David Shapiro podcast. Yep, that just launched on his uh, Patreon. I think he's going to probably put it outside the paywall pretty soon. He's been moving towards like a completely open model. So yeah, my overall analytics are, I guess, looking pretty healthy. I made almost $100 this month. Definitely gained a lot of subscribers. Definitely feel like things are going well. Met a bunch of fun people at NAB. Even got a couple emails of potential sponsors. And let me know if you ever see any of the other, especially AI YouTubers or maybe anybody that I really should be connecting with coming to Las Vegas, let me know. Because conventions like CES and NAB seem to be really good ways to connect with people. Something where AI would be like discussed and there'd be some sort of speaker here in Vegas. So if you ever just see any of that, like my email is in the about section and I do read it or just leave a comment or whatever. So yep, that'll do it for the news today. Thanks for watching. Smash that subscribe button. See you guys in the next video.